Hello. It's a bit weird being back, isn't it? Um, first talk in three years, so please be gentle. I shall try and uh, pass, uh, to share some good information for you. So, um, in this talk, I'm going to be giving you, I'm going to start off with a very brief introduction to my own work to provide some context about how I became interested in this field and also the kinds of things that I tend to make. Um, and given that it's a hacker camp, I will be focusing on a lot of practical tips to help you prototype and experiment, as well as throwing in, sprinkling in some um, inspiring uh, use cases from artistic and industry. Um, so I'm, I'm going to give you a whistle-stop tour of a few different parts of soft electronics. I'm going to start off with electronic embroidery, and then I'm going to touch on e-textiles uh, before moving on to flexible circuits, soft robotics, and then the concept of softness in electronics. So that's what the next half an hour is going to be full of. I hope you enjoy it. So as I say, uh, let's start off with a little introduction to myself. So my day job now, I'm head of community at Crowd Supply, which is a curated crowdfunding platform for open source hardware, part of Mauser Electronics, which you may have heard of. Um, but before I went, moved over to the US to do that job, um, I spent many years as a writer and a professional maker. I used to write about hardware for Make Magazine and Hackaday and blah, blah, blah. But I also um, wrote a book um, called The Crafty Kids Guide to DIY Electronics electronics, which is a children's book about electronics taught through craft. So um, this was the first time that I, I mean, I, I'd done sewable electronics before and I'd done electronic embroidery, but this was the first time that I really went deep um, during the research for this book. Um, and it made me notice the switch in my audience. So I'd done, as I say, I'd done personal, from, throughout my personal curiosity, um, I'd experimented with sewable electronics, um, but um, the teaching the basic concept of electronics through craft really helped me hit a different audience. It suddenly became 90% um, little girls and 10% boys. And I was like, what is going on here? It's pretty interesting. By putting electronics in the context of craft, it really changed um, the type of people that were coming to my workshops. So, and this is a talk at a, hacker a hacker conference, not an education conference. So I'm not going to go too deep into the pedagogical details. Um, but I will say that my experiences running workshops, teaching basic electronics uh, with a standard through-hole learn-to-solder kit versus a sewing circuits kit was completely different. It taught largely the same skills, you know, simple circuits, parallel circuits, yada, 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 um, but the medium completely changed the demographics and the vibe, so I thought that was really interesting. Um, after the book was published, um, I worked on another project here that, worked, that put technology in the context of craft. And this is the Mini Moo. It's my hand on the box, hand model as well as an electronics weirdo. Um, it's a DIY wearable instrument that I designed for P. Maroney and Imogen Heap. Um, kids so, um, so wire, code, and play this glove. It's really cute. It's based on the Mini Moo, which is an expensive, like two and a half grand MIDI controller. Um, but uh, but this is this is like forty dollars, so a much cheaper and um, really fun thing. And again, it was it was a, a very appealing project to teen and tween girls who were experimenting with microcontrollers. Um, and actually, um, the kids in the workshop who were good at sewing um, had a confidence boost at the beginning of the lesson, and also they got onto the coding portion and earlier than the people who were not so good at sewing. So it balanced out the classroom a little bit. That was quite fun. Moving on, and the final strand of my personal work that I wanted to introduce you to is instrument making. So when I wasn't making things for other people, I tend to make instruments um, or sound making devices. And I like to use experimental materials in that work from soft electronics, electronic embroidery and so on, but also using architectural materials and kind of sculptural materials. So that's me in a nutshell very quickly, and hopefully that will give you some context, context for the rest of this talk. I've been using these technologies in my own work for a number of years, so hopefully some of my learning, my painful learning, will help you avoid the pain as you start experimenting with any of these techniques. So, when most people think about electronics, they think about wires and boxes and stiff fiberglass printed circuit boards. Now, the wires in those boxes and the traces on the circuit boards are all just paths for electricity to move along. 
And by choosing a different type of material to make these paths, we can make all sorts of unexpected and exciting electronics. In this example, we're looking at an embroidery sampler with a very simple circuit. You've got at the bottom, you've got a 3V coin cell, um, and then there's an LED at the top. Um, and you can make the same circuit on a breadboard, or on a printed circuit board, or just by soldering some wires together. But here, the fiberglass, that is over there, I'm pointing up here. <laughs> here, the fiberglass of the circuit board is replaced by felt, and the copper traces are replaced by uh, curvy, flowing stitches, in this case, um, based on, I think, a steel thread. Um, I would say that these kind of embroidery hoops are actually really great for learning to sew um, conductive stuff because it keeps everything in one place. More on that in a moment. Okay, onwards. So, conductive thread, yes, a whole slide on this. So, it's the starting point for most people who want to experiment with soft electronics. So, I'm going to spend you a little time here guiding you through um, the basics of what exists and, and what you might like. So, my number one, I've got two favorites, and I've tried pretty much every conductive thread on the market. Um, but the, the, there's, there's, um, there's a few different genres of thread. Let's take a look at some of these. So, Th these are just my own genres of thread. They're not like official technical titles, I will say that. So there's, there's a type of thread that's quite fluffy, and you might see um, like strands coming off of on it, like something like this, um, a fluffy type of thread. Now, that kind of thread knots really well, but because it's fluffy like this, you can see you've got all of these threads coming off of the side. And if you sew things too close together, it's like short circuit city. So like any single one of those threads touches another bit of a thread and your circuit isn't going to work. So a practical tip that I use here is um, you, after you've sewn things in place, um, just spray it with a little bit of hairspray and that will keep the hair, that will keep the flyaways in place. Um, so that's that one. Um, and then there's another type of thread that is nowadays more common. It's a waxy type of thread. Um, you will find that sold by Adafruit and just generally out of there. Um, it doesn't cause short circuits, but the knots really like to come undone. So again, a little tip here that I've learned in my years of experience is to just put a little dab of either hot glue or clear nail varnish on your knots after you've made them to keep them from going out undone. So you've got the fluffy, you've got the waxy, and then you've got the um, you've got the metal base, the metal ones that are pure metal. So there's and this is mostly made by a company, a German company called Karl Grimm. Um, absolutely beautiful threads. You can solder them. All the other types of threads you can't solder. You can solder the Karl Grimm ones, but it's very brittle to work with. Very nice though. But then, my number one favorite is a thread called Madeira, um, and they do fantastic. And you can use that, so you can use that in both the top and bottom of a sewing machine, so um, they're great. You can buy Madeira thread only from one place in the UK, and that's Light Stitches. Um, but they're a German company again. Um, you can buy them on the internet as well, but if you, yeah, they're, they're quite hard to get hold of, but yeah. The, the, um, the Madeira threads are um, developed by a professional embroidery company, which I will have a look at later. Um, but yeah, so those are my favorites, and those are the genres and my tips for working with each of the genres of thread. But just make sure you take care of, uh, take care of these things. Right, there we go, let's move on. Okay, two more um, very practical tips to give you, um, which is um, the things to watch out for when you're starting off with sewing your circuits are loose connections and dangling knots. So loose connections means that you're likely to have an incomplete circuit. So wiggling your component about, maybe your circuit lights up sporadically, then you've probably got a loose connection. Um, but once you, so you, you should make, make your connections really nice and tight and snug, and three tight stitches should do it quite nicely. And once you've got your component stitch on nice and tight, um, you also need to keep an eye out for knots and loose ends, which can dangle around and make short circuits. And that's why you start out on these embroidery hoops, because you can flip them over really nicely and inspect the back. I'd say nine times out of 10, when I've run embroidery workshops, um, it's, it's been loose underneath um, wires that cause the first errors. So yeah, definitely watch out for those two things. So those basic tips that I just shared should start you out on embroidering electronics. And I wanted to bring this slide up here to take a look 
at some more advanced techniques. And this is, um, this is an, um, an embroidered synthesizer that I made last, last year, which is actually a riff on a noisemaker called a crackle box or crackdos. If, sorry, Dutch hackers, if I just mangled your language. Um, but there's a Dutch artist in the 60s that made, um, that made this called the Michael Weisswitz. Um, and this is my version of it. Um, and so the three techniques on this project that, I, um, so that you might find useful um, are in the center, you can see that there's a chip on the board, um, an eight-leg chip. Um, and making through hole, oh sorry, yeah, so by adding a chip, you can either solder individual legs, which historically was what most people did, really difficult. And if your chip burns out, um, you've got to unpick everything, and it's a disaster. So I made um, a series of flex PCBs with castellated edges that I could solder the dip chip socket into and then sew the flex PCB onto the embroidery service. And that means you can remove the chips. Those are all on my GitHub, I think. Uh, <laughs> um, so that's that's a that's a tip, um, and I don't see many. I don't see anyone else doing that. So I wanted to like be like, you should do this. You should totally do this. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say is, pretty much any through hole component can become a sewable component, um, and the way that you use it is uh, the way you do that is um, with a power of needle nose pliers. And you just basically twist the component round and round the needle nose pliers until it forms a loop, smush it down a little bit, and then just sew it on. You can see there, I've done that with um, the two capacitors. So you just make a little loop to sew it onto a thing. That works for LEDs, that works for light sensors. You can do, you can put quite a lot of through hole components onto, um, onto a, a piece of embroidery and with very little effort, just a, just a pair of needle nose pliers. So, okay, and this is a really example, this is an amazing example, this is not my work, I am not this good. This is an example of really advanced electronic embroidery from an artist called Irene Posh. Um, this is actually a fully functional, programmable 8-bit computer made with gold embroidery and magnets. So this actually works, it flips over. Look her up on the internet, she's got loads of really interesting pieces of work. Yes, that's Irene Posh and the Embroidered Computer, very cool project. Okay, um, so the field of electronic embroidery is like maturing at a rapid pace at the moment. It used to be a bit more of a niche technology, mostly practiced by DIYers like me, artists, academics, and so on. But nowadays there are new materials, new machines, and new processes bringing them into industry. I spent two weeks with the folks at Microsoft Research just before the pandemic hit, and I was lucky enough to see one of these bad boys in action. This is a ZSK industrial embroidery machine loaded up with Madeira thread, which, if you were paying attention earlier, is my favorite type of thread. So here you see, and um, normally I would play a video for this, but um, it, it, didn't, it doesn't really work. So basically, it's incredibly fast. This is an industrial machine that is picking and placing and like creating these um, threads that are capacitive touch. And the, the microcontroller you can see in the middle there is the Adafruit Circuit Playground Express. And yes, the, embro the embroidery machine did embroider that in place as well automatically. It's like, this does not convey the speed of this thing. It's an industrial machine, so when it's up and running, it sounds like a machine gun, and it's done in seconds. It's incredible, and it was the first time I've seen a microcontroller being placed on an industrial embroidery machine, so it's very exciting. Still fairly experimental, but it's really coming into it. Um, so these are another thing from the industrial. These are um, pick and place sequins. Um, basically, in order to create more advanced e-textiles, you need to have a way to industrialize them. And that includes a way of mass, you know, you've got to have these mass produced. So you can't hand sew on all of these things. So lots of, lots of development at the moment is going into creating um, components that can be used in the embroidery industry's version of a pick and place machine. It's very cool. Um, and one more example of industrial electronic embroidery. This is really cool. So this is actually being, this is not experimental. This is actually in use at the moment. And um, this is what we call moss embroidery, which is a chenille fabric technique that you might see on uh, towels and carpets and so on. And, and tufts of the thread are, are pushed through a, a, a substrate, and they create this like mossy loop kind of effect. 
And this is used in medicine a lot now um, as electrodes, instead, especially for people with sensitivities to adhesives or babies. These are sewn into stretchy garments that are then placed on the body to, to sense various things instead of having like metal electrodes. So it's, it's soft, it's, it's non-allergenic, and it's actually, um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's really great for all sorts of things. And not only, it, not only um, an input, it doesn't only sense things, this actually is used as an output for electro-stimulation therapy of muscles and so on. So yeah, this is actually in use today, so that's really cool. Moving on briefly to um, e-textiles. It's used very generically. It's not super useful anymore, the word e-textiles, but I'm using it here to refer to conductive materials that have cloth-like properties. Um, so there's two different types of fabric. There's woven versus knit. Um, the difference between that is the yarn or the thread that composes them. So a knit fabric is made up of one yarn looped around continuously. And a woven fabric is made of intersecting yarns, crossing each other at right angles to the grain. Um, so knit conductive fabric has different um, resistance in each direction as a result, um, but the woven fabric is the same on each side because it's the thing. And these, both of these fabrics are available from Adafruit if you want to have a go on them. Another great material you might want to have an experiment with is Velostat. Velostat is pressure sensitive fabric. It's much, much cheaper to use um, than pressure sensitive sensors um, and you can cut it out and you can make flexible sensors with it. I made meowing yoga pants with my, fr with my friend um, Phoenix once using Velostat. Definitely, if you're interested, it's a great material to have on your radar and pretty cheap as well. I also wanted to give a shout out to various types of tapes. Um, this is my neighbor. When I used to live in Berlin, I made, um, made, them, made her a cape. Um, but here, this is using, so copper tape is everywhere, um, and you can, you, can, you can use like just ordinary slug tape from hardware, that's fine for putting it on fabric. But actually, I much prefer a fabric conductive tape, which is made of nylon. Um, you can get them from Adafruit, or you, it's also called Maker Tape, and you can get that from Brain Dog Gadgets, and that's what I've used in this project. Um, it's a really nice... Um, it's, it's really nice to use on fabric, and it's very, very quick and dirty. It's great for prototyping. Um, another ax I know, um, another um, tape I wanted to give a shout out to is Z-axis tape, which is what Chibitronics uses, and that's only conductive on the Z-axis, so it's really fun for sticker type stuff. I also have an honorable melting. I don't do felting, but I know people do, and you can get conductive felting stuff. So if you like stabbing things with needles to make them into shapes, there are conductive materials available for you to do that. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out to crochet, another a dark art as far as I'm concerned. Um, but um, this is a piece of work um, done by um, Dr. Anarato Reddy, and she does lots and lots of crochet. Um, and she argues that yarn is harder, and she's done lots and lots of really interesting electronics crochet projects. Um, I, she did a talk at the Open Hardware Summit this year called Knotty Hardware that I would highly recommend you check out as well. Um, one of the most essential things for people to be aware of when they're going into um, elect uh, sewable electronics is you must know about the Bible of sewable electronics, which is the Cobacant website. Um, this is one of their pieces. They make extremely high-end, beautiful. This is, a, this is the morning dress that they made, and it's a wailing speaker. Those are hand-sewn speakers that work on that dress. It's an exquisite piece of work. Um, but the, the website that you put there, that I put there, is called How to Get What You Want, and it is filled with ideas and workshops and projects that they've done and really well documented. So you should really be aware of that. Okay, moving on very briefly to flexible circuit boards. So the, the substrate of a normal circuit board is made of fiberglass, which is a very stiff material. In a flexible circuit board, um, the material substrate is made out of is called captain. And it's laser cut instead of rooted, which means you can make some much more interesting shapes. 
Now, Flex is not new. It's been used in industry for a very long time, but it's only made its way into the maker DIY world recently because Oshpark, this um, US circuit board service, um, made it available very cheaply, and I've been experimenting with it. So this photograph, I put it up here, it's, it's by this guy called Carl Bajager, and he's got, he does loads of Flex experiments on YouTube. So if you are interested in Flex, definitely check out his YouTube channel. I can't, I can't do all this. So, so some of the practical use, reasons to use Flex are obviously it flexes. Hello. Um, it's also very thin, um, you can make, and it's also laser cuttable, so you can make really intricate shapes. Um, there are a lot of design considerations for Flex. For example, like the minimum bend radiance. You've got to, you've got to use teardrop shapes on your vias and pads. Um, but it's actually surprisingly easy to experiment with, especially if you go via Oshpark because there's, um, they've got like um, the design rules up there. So would highly recommend, and that's Central Watch, which is great. Um, that's my project that used Vocoder. Let's move on. Okay, Soft Robotics um, is, um, so this is, if you've been out into, into the, if you might have seen the, these people, this is the, the same people that did the tentacles um, in the reef. Um, they're eye giants and they, they make huge emotionally expressive robots, robotic creatures and spaces, like really, really cool stuff. And they're here, so you should definitely, definitely go and check those out while you're here. So conventional robots are typically made from rigid parts, which makes them vulnerable to harm from bumps and scrapes and so on. And these these parts also make them fairly immobile. They can't squeeze past things. They are their shape. They do what they do. But soft robots um, are being made out of elastic and rubber and all of these things. And a lot of the designs are inspired by octopuses and starfish and worms and so on. And this is an octopus bot, uh, which is a squishy underwater robot with eight limbs that bend in every direction. And it's got a pneumatic control core. It's very cool. So it expands the mantle with water, jets out the fluid to shoot forward, and then the floppy arms stiffen in turn to crawl over things. And then it can squish in between rocks to get places. So this kind of technology and soft robotics is a really exciting field full of lots of challenges for different spaces. It's very cool. Um, if you want to get started out with it, um, there are a few things starting to come onto the market that are suitable for DIYers. This is Programmable Air, which is an Arduino-based pneumatics platform um, by, uh, by Tinkermind there on, on Twitter. Um, so if you're interested in experimenting, do check that out. And then finally, we're talking briefly about the concept of software and electronics. So this is my tentacle project. I've actually resurrected it. I'll take it to the pub afterwards so you can play with it. it. I made this when I was really depressed, and I wanted something soft and loving and comforting to wrap around me and like you know do something comforting, which was purring. Um, and I've just really enjoyed. Um, wait, hang on. Where's my slides gone? Oh no, we're not watching that. I haven't got time for that. I haven't got time for that. Yeah, here we are. So, so this might the, the softness. I wanted something something to wrap around me, and by putting the electronics inside of something soft, it completely changed the feeling of of that piece of electronics. I think material choice can really change a project. So. This is um, a leather glove. I've actually got this with me as well. But it's like an elbow length glove. Um, and it's exactly the same code as the children's glove from earlier. But the material choice felt for children. And then this like amazing black leather for me, it completely changed the vibe of the material. So that's a, that's, it, consider your material choices and consider what they will do to the people who are interacting with your electronics. You can do some really, really interesting things. <sighs> okay, um, and then I've got a bonus slide. Yes, I've got three minutes left. I got to my bonus slide, amazing. So I haven't even touched on the cool microcontrollers and single board computers that you might use with these kinds of things, but here are my favorites. If you're just getting started, I would highly recommend either the Adafruit Circuit Playground Express or the Microbit. Both of them come with really nice large pin pads, so even little kids can sew through them. 
Um, if you're moving on, if you're already familiar with microcontrollers and single board computers, my two favorites are, um, I, I'm such a fangirl for Bella. Um, Bella uh, um, and Bella and BeagleBoard um, are a really great combination um, for really amazing embedded, um, low latency stuff. Um, and, and in fact, somebody from Bella is actually here this weekend. I think they're doing, Becky Stewart's doing a workshop on Sunday, um, which I'm hoping to go to as well. Um, really, like I love Bella for, for that kind of stuff. Another big uh, person that I really like are the solder party boards. Um, they're done by this Swedish guy called Arturo, and he's got a lot of really interesting um, boards that use castellated edges, which are normally used for prototyping and breadboards. Um, but for me, it's a great hook to, to, to um, secure my stitches in place. So you put the stitch through one, um, and then you, the castellated edge basically hooks it on. So it's really nice and secure. I love a castellated edge board for sewing. Um, and then finally, um, two shout outs to people who are actually doing made uh, boards for, made for these kinds of things. One is the Make Fashion people up in, uh, up in Canada, and they're doing, they've actually got some new boards coming out, which have got some fascinating stretchy plaited cables. Very exciting about those. Lots of LEDs for their stuff. So if you're interested in integrating LEDs into your work, um, check those people out. And also a big shout out and a big thank you to the original um, Made for Sewables um, range, which was Arduino. I mean, we, it was an Arduino series of boards by Leah Buckley from MIT, and she did the Lily pad series, which is open source hardware as well. As are many, in fact, uh, everything apart from the micro bit that I've listed here is open source hardware. Oh, I don't know about make fashion, who knows? But many of them are open source hardware. So if you're interested in actually creating some of your own stuff for this, you can just go along and take a look at what they've done. So I've got 20, I think that's it. I've done half an hour. This, is a, <laughs> this was like an hour long talk, so I've, I've kind of had to compress it a lot. But I hope that I've given you a whistle stop tour of some of the fun stuff that can come with soft electronics with some practical tips and uh yeah, that's me. Um, I'm very friendly. Please, find, you know, I'm on Twitter and I chat to people, so please do come and see. Hi, I'm going to be outside in the robot arms with my tentacle um, after this if you've got any questions. I'm also, um, if anybody's got a 9 volt battery, I, <laughs> I forgot mine. If anyone's got a 9 volt battery, I might resurrect my um, embroidered synthesizer this weekend as well. So, um, yeah, also I'm doing a shift, the last shift at the bar this evening, so you can find me before or after. That's it, There's, and that's me, half an hour, I'm done, thank you. <laughs>